Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode number 25 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis Dahl from Summer Dental Laboratories in Zionsville, Indiana. And you know, I'm Barbara Wojan, Night Dental Group, Oldsmar, Florida. We made it to number 25, which is almost half my age. So uh, that means we're pretty mature, Elvis. I think we're getting better. It only took us 25 episodes to get pretty good at this. You're saying we're mature now? I'm saying we're mature now, yes. I'm not sure I'm totally mature, but I can tell you this. I'm a whole hell of a lot happier now than I was when I was 25, and I've learned a lot more, and I absolutely love what I do, and I'm extremely happy. So hopefully you're feeling that way. And so are our podcast uh, listeners. We're getting better. I think I've listened to a couple of the first and second episodes, and we're definitely getting better. You finally listened to an episode? <laughs> yes, I've listened to an episode. I don't necessarily like how deep my voice is, Man, but I good. actually did listen, yes. <laughs> you do have a nice deep voice. <laughs> Thanks. We want to give a big thank you to JDT Magazine. They are giving Barb and I a wonderful three-page article on the latest issue of JDT. Yay! Hopefully, some people that have not heard of the podcast yet will see the article and take a listen. It mentions where the idea of the show came from and how Barb and I became co-hosts. Plus, I got to say, it's got two pictures of the most gorgeous people in the industry. <laughs> On podcasts, <laughs> on dental podcast technology. Uh, on dental podcast technology, the most gorgeous two people. Hey, maybe someday we'll be famous, so please Absolutely. listen. Check it out, too. Feel free to cut those pictures out and hang them on your bench so you can look at us all day long. <laughs> Plus, you know, we really want to give a big thank you to everyone at JDT Magazine for their continued support of the podcast. Yeah, thank you, guys. We appreciate you. Yeah, we're one big happy family. This week, we start part one of a conversation about air quality. I know my lab has dust everywhere. And no matter how much we clean, and we do, just because of the nature of what we do, the dust just keeps coming back. And it shows up in places in the lab where we're not even doing any grinding or any other dust-causing work. And it's in the air, it's in our lungs... And with zirconia, do we even know what the long-term effects are? So Ted Fries, a lab owner, connected with a company that makes commercial air purifying systems. He put them in his lab. You know, he calls them a game changer. Yep. So joining us are... So joining us are... <laughs> that was great timing, actually. Okay. <laughs> Joining us are Blake Bobowski and Mike Booth from the Fellows brand talking about the Aramex Pro. I can tell you that these two gentlemen are amazing and the equipment that they have, I, I brought them into the laboratory, I had them look at my lab. You know, it's pretty special to put these things in your lab, just even if you don't have a problem, which, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that we do or we don't, but I mean, it just cleans the air. It uh, makes people happy knowing that you're going the extra step to take care of them. Uh, and I think it's pretty interesting. So uh, I'm glad to bring this to the air. I think it's interesting. And so enjoy, guys. Let's get right to it. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's a pretty interesting interview roundtable that we have going on. Tad Freeze from Rocket Dental Lab in Wheaton, Illinois contacted me a while ago saying he had this great idea for a uh, podcast episode. In true Tad fashion, when I answered, what is it? Three months later, he answers me. <laughs> <laughs> I have these guys that I know that put in air filters in his lab, and it's really helped the quality. So I'd like to welcome Tad. Welcome to the group, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How is everybody? We are fine. Great. Good. And then let's see if I get this straight. The company is called Fellows? Yes, Fellows Brands, correct. Fellows Brands. And I have Mike Booth and Blake Babowski. Am I saying that That's correct? That's perfect. Thank you, Elvis. Thanks for joining us, guys. I appreciate it. So let's talk about this for a bit. I know here in our lab, air quality, you know it's bad. I mean, you see it by the thin layer of everything on everything in our lab. Even when we moved to CAD CAM, 
it's even more pronounced in that room. So let's talk about what you guys do, especially in Tad's lab, to help improve. Sure, absolutely. So um, I met Tad through some mutual friends and uh, through conversation brought up that I, I handle air treatment for North America. And he said, what? And he said in his labs, from what they do on a daily basis with the fabricating, that the air quality is pretty poor. So we set up a meeting, went to their lab did some air quality checks and lo and behold, the air quality was, was very poor. So that started the initial conversations. And uh, since then we uh, installed seven of our air purifying machines. We have an integrated smart solution that uh, you mount on the wall. So it's, it's not in the way of, of the employees and they're a smart solution for air treatment. They turn on by motion, odor, noise, and then they have laser particle sensors that are actually measuring the particulate matter that's in the in the air from PM 2.5 down to 0.3 microns. So visually, the lab owner, the employee can see at an instant, you know, how the air quality is. So we, we like to say we make the invisible visible with our new technology. So I have a question. So when you go into a laboratory um, such as TADS and you test the air quality, how are you testing it? How do you rate it when it comes back? What are you looking for in terms of good, bad, average, um, so that you know that the air quality is bad? Because I've had uh, Night Dental's air quality checked probably twice in the past three years. And my employees are constantly complaining of dust. But every time I get the quality of the air checked, um, they always tell me that it's, you know, it's average to good. So like, what are you using to identify this? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. There are a few simple ways of measuring air quality in general. And what if we if we step outside of the dental lab environment specifically, you know, the most common and cheapest method of measuring air quality would be to look at CO2 levels, carbon dioxide. And that's normally a good indicator that your ventilation system is doing its job. It's getting the right levels of CO2 out. And um, you know, a byproduct of that is ensuring you've got healthy oxygen levels within the environment. But it's just really an indicator for a more generic general environment. When it comes to a, a specific application, such as a dental laboratory, you know, you really need to take a look at what's the what, what are the substances that are going to pose the greatest risk to the people working in that environment. So that's why, you know, Blake mentioned PM 2.5. Our units uh, take a, a close look at PM 2.5. What it basically means is um, particles below the size of 2.5 microns. So these aren't things that you can see. Um, these are the fine particles that really get deep into your respiratory system get into your lungs and because of that size they also stay in your lungs as well we we measure those as well as specifically looking at the really fine particles 0.3 micron particles so these are, are not visible even with daylight coming through a window or in front of a projector a projector lamp you can't see these these particles in the air and that's the best way of, of really taking a look at the the substances that are going to be a, a the most pose the most risk obviously beyond that you know in a in a laboratory environment you you've got also risk from uh, chemicals that are being released as part of multiple processes and then bioaerosols either through human-to-human uh, -human interaction within the lab or um, coming in from um, product that's coming in from a, a the customer base which is you know somewhat out of the lab's control so there are multiple things that make air go bad but uh, the thing that we pay most closest attention to is the particle levels in the air. So Barbara, when they initially came into the laboratory, when Blake and I started this, we actually put meters all over the lab for several months. Pretty, if I remember Blake, I don't remember what the cost was, but these were substantially expensive air quality meters that, that were counting the part particles per million at different areas in the laboratory. I think we had six or seven of them posted and we were running reports. And the numbers that were coming through at the beginning before we had air quality installed and then the numbers that were happening afterwards were dramatically different. You know, talking numbers in the thousands before down to the 50 to 150. Wow. It, it, was, it was dramatic. Whatever the number met, it was dramatic. You know, we were measuring really the ultra fine particles, uh, 0.3 size. 
And, you know, on average, it, the measurements from the different locations were probably about 80,000 at the time. And then after installation of the machines, when we rechecked it, uh, they're down to normal le levels under a thousand. So, um, and the 0.3 microns that we're talking about, they're so ultra fine. These are the sizes of particles that you ingest and that you can't you can't get out of your system. Yeah, we had the um, the meters as well placed throughout the laboratory. Unfortunately, it was only for a couple of days. And so I think maybe we need to have it longer. Uh, we, we had a HEPA filter put in. We've had a couple of the machines in the air, you know, that come in and they suck all the dust out of the air. But I'd be really interested in having you folks in. Come, come check out my lab because it's an extremely important um, thing for me, keeping the employees safe as well as myself, you know, and, and everybody else. So interesting. Yeah. And, and I'd like to say just when we do an on-site visit and we're doing a demonstration with our peer review technology, every lab I've, I've gone to with the actual machine, after we, we discuss a number of things, we'll, we'll do a demonstration of the machine and we turn it on. And most of the times, depending on where we are in the lab, the, the measurement on the machine is already going right to pour. What's what's really cool about our the technology is after no uh, motion or no sound for 20 minutes, if the air quality is still poor, it will ramp up to fan speed five and do a deep cleaning of the air. Mm -hmm. So throughout the day, the air quality could be getting a little worse, but mm -hmm. when everybody leaves at the end of the day and if the air quality uh, is registering poor, it will go into that deep clean cycle. So when you come back to the lab the next morning, you're working in a clean environment. I did have one department that had registered higher levels of CO2. They were still, you know, within means, but we did have to get the air circulating better and get a vent in there and, and clean that up. But my concern is the zirconia dust, you know, and all of those particles, because my air handler takes the air from the laboratory, takes it into the HEPA filter and puts it back into the laboratory. Um, and there's a lot of concern there that it's, you know, uh, taking dust out and blowing dust back in, even though the HEPA filter is supposed to take out 99.4% of the particles and all of that, you know, you still have a concern that it's going back into the environment. So I'd be really curious to check that out. So thanks. I think one of the, you know, just about a couple of comments here as well. I think the key question here is what what is good? And, mm -hmm. you know, if, um, if we take a look at guidance from the EPA, from the World Health Organization, from the um, Air Quality Index, you know, they're typically targeting levels, PM 2.5 levels below 15 or even below 12 mm -hmm. micrograms per cubic meter. And admittedly, this is for, you know, a, a good air quality working environment such as an office. But, you know, in our mind, there's no reason why someone working in a dental lab environment isn't deserved of the same level of air quality. And we, we've, we're able to mm -hmm. achieve that level of air quality. We're able to provide a, a solution that um, takes in high levels of PM 2.5. You know, in Tad's environment, some of our units were showing over 200 or 250 micrograms per cubic meter. You know, at certain times of the year, that's like being in Delhi or, um, you know, other more polluted cities around the world. Uh, and we can we can achieve a significant reduction in those PM 2.5 levels. So, you know, our, our system is really there to go above and beyond maybe some of the standard requirements. It's really for those that want to provide the next level of clean and the next level of health for, for their people, people like that. Yeah. So do you guys check quality of air around the lab to get a baseline? I mean, how do you not know that already the air is poor prior to the lab work? That's a great question. So on, on a recent visit, we bring an air quality monitor so we can we can go to the different rooms within the lab and actually give a just a quick visual representation of what the air quality is showing us. In one of my last lab visits with the owner of the lab and the HR director, I think it was after the fourth uh, air quality check, they got they got the message that their air quality was pretty poor. And um, that's when we started to really sit down, uh, go through the demonstration, the filtration process uh, of our peer review units, and um, just reconfirming on what we can actually do to help provide a healthier environment. So what areas in the lab are worse than others? Model room. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. Model room and milling. Yep. 
Yeah. Draconia. Yeah. yeah, it's am- it's amazing. Well, I can tell you when when we were doing the more robust testing with the sensors all over, and that's that's definitely not commonplace. That was just a major project that we put in place to really see what a laboratory was like before and after air cleaning. The second you would even start grinding or adjusting porcelain in an area will spike your air quality. So it's a fluctuating system of air cleaning all throughout the day. So obviously your your gypsum areas and places that you're grinding heavily are going to be your worst. When when we looked at it, though, it was interesting. You You can do all the scientific mumbo jumbo and get all the numbers, but if you're in your lab for an, for enough time, you know where the dust accumulates and you know your dirty spots. Mm-hmm. And oh, sure. we used to, you know, we have a boardroom table that we have our meetings at that's upstairs that nobody really uses unless we're having a meeting. And, you know, our cleaning crew, you know, a, a commercial cleaning crew that comes in to clean our laboratory, it, if, if it went two to three days, you could write your name in the dust on the table yeah. upstairs. Mm. I mean, that even with the cleaning crew, when we put in the first set of air cleaners, and this is such a generic way to look at it, you could not write your name on that table, and we didn't wipe it intentionally for 30 days. And there was no significant dust on the table where you could write a letter, or carve your name into the table. It, it was, to me, I was like, this is a terrible example, but such a great example. Well, sometimes you need that visual. I think it's a great example. <laughs> I actually do that at night. We went to a one piece flow line and we brought the mills out into the environment. And at that point, my employees were extremely stressed about all the dust. And so that's what I did um, nightly was to see if the dust would accumulate on my phone or on the desks, I wipe them down, leave them alone. And, um, you know, there was more dust. Not, and I got a couple of those air quality cleaners that actually suck it out of the air into the filters. I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of what we're talking about now. But but it's a pretty pretty relevant factor that if you can't write your name, the dust is gone, and that's pretty uh, pretty impressive. And, and just to add to that, I think you know, with Tad's employees, you know, after in, installation, you know, I think and Tad can speak to it. But after uh, the first week or two, they noticeably talked about how clean the air was, and um, and that's that's just reassurance to us that the product is working and. And and what what we're selling is is the truth of the matter that that the air quality can be cleaned in a localized environment. I think it's really interesting hearing you know the more simple visual indicators of air quality improvements because you know to, to use Tad's phrase of scientific mumbo jumbo you know you can we can bamboozle people with big numbers and big readings of really tiny particles but at the end of the day how do people feel and and what sort of a difference can you feel within the working environment? So the dust on a table, you open up one of the units and see the filter after one month or two months, you know, and then you realize I'd rather have that in the filter than in my lungs or in the lungs of my team. Um, and there was a, r- a really interesting comment that came from another lab, a lab in Michigan where we've got our units in place. And the owner of that lab gave me a really strange comment, which was that normally on a daily basis she would have sneezing fits where she'd sneeze six eight or ten times in a row and she commented that since the units have been in place those sneezing fits have just stopped so you know for her it wasn't about big numbers or 99 percent reduction in airborne contamination it was something as simple as a sneezing fit that used to happen to me every day has just gone away yeah so what's the difference between your guys's air purifier and me going out and buying a bunch of honey wells off of Amazon. Why is that not sufficient in a lab? So, I mean, you could go out and buy residential units. You just need a ton of them to be able to really make a difference in a in a commercial environment, in a commercial working environment. And it really comes down to, we talk about four main pillars uh, as to what makes us uh, different in the marketplace and what separates this out as a commercial solution. So the first thing is smart. Blake's mentioned the sensor technology. We, we have Envira Smart technology mm-hmm. that uses uh, particle sensor, odor sensor, and then sound and motion sensors. So the unit will work harder when the air gets worse, but it'll also power down 
if there's no occupancy and no air quality issue, meaning it's um, it's saving money maybe over a weekend when the air quality is maybe a little bit better. But the moment someone walks into that lab on a Monday morning, the system is ready to do its job at the start of the week, just like just like the rest of your team will be. Mm-hmm. And then the screen is also a part of our smart technology, which is giving that real-time feedback, uh, which can either be a complex PM2.5 reading, or it can just be simply a percentage of the particles that are being removed in real time. So that's smart. Effective is our filtration um, and our airflow capacity. So we use commercial grade filters, commercial grade HEPA, active carbon, um, a bipolar ionizer, and then an antimicrobial layer on the filter itself, which just prevents um, bioaerosols from growing and festering further on the filter. And then we have you know commercial levels of, of airflow capacity as well, because in, a, in any commercial environment, but especially a, a dental lab, you really want to be targeting bare minimum of three, ideally five air changes on an hourly basis. So what you're really looking to do is change the air in that space once every 12 minutes. So to do that, it's all about airflow Mm -hmm. and getting that airflow through a good set of filters. Um, The third element, the third pillar is integration. So our units are designed to be wall mounted, which means that they get a good reach. They really throw the air away from the unit, which helps get a good coverage of the space. And it also means that they're not an interference. They're up on the wall, out of the way. Once they're installed, you set it, forget it, and then there's really no interaction other than a a six monthly filter change for for a dental lab. And then the fourth pillar for us is reliability. So unlike residential units, these systems come with a five year warranty um, it's a commercial grade build. They're designed to be used 24 seven, 365 days a year. And, you know, we put the fellow's brand's name on this system um, as a 101 year old family owned business. You know, when, um, mm-hmm. when the company puts their surname or the family name on a product, um, they really need to believe that it's going to stand the test of time. Is your company um, tailor made for dental laboratories or do you service all kinds of manufacturing facilities and how did you get into the dental? So we, from an air quality standpoint, we focus on mainly commercial environments. So we do have a residential range that you can find on Amazon today, but that's really for primarily allergy sufferers in a home environment. Our commercial systems, we we cover um, medical type applications and within that we would include dental and dental laboratories, education facilities, corporate environments, um, and then hospitality environments as well. We don't go into industrial. So there are systems out there for warehousing or pharmaceutical or food production. We don't go into that space. You know, there's big, big, big open spaces that um, our systems are just not designed to cater for. Uh, but then as a, as a total company, Fellows is really focused on on a broader level of just serving the business professional. So we're known primarily for the Bankers Box brand um, and then commercial shredders, which is a big part of our business today as well. So we have a good reputation of uh, designing, engineering and manufacturing good, reliable machines that help businesses keep performing on a daily basis. So the way we got into dental, you know, as, as Blake said, it was a, a conversation with, um, with, with Tad here in the US that really kind of triggered us to think about the specific air quality challenges that are faced on a daily basis in a dental lab environment. And then in other parts of the world, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not a local Chicago guy. Um, I've relocated over from the UK where I was looking after the European business for, for this category for fellows. And we've been looking at dental applications for, for a couple of years now. And we actually have um, a number of dental customers in Italy, in Spain, in Poland and in France uh, that are using these systems already. So um, it, we're um, we're excited about uh, the, the future for this um for this application because it's an area where there's a known issue and we can really make a difference. I'll be honest with you, in my laboratory, it's a really, really hot topic. And it has been uh, as long as I've been managing it where um, my employees are extremely concerned about the air quality. And I go, oh, I really feel like I, you know, go over and above to try to keep them healthy. But, you know, like I said, I'd be really interested in having you all come take a look at the lab, test the environment and see, because I think it's not been tailored to 
the laboratory environment, the people that I've had come in. And so, you know, I, I think it's great. So thanks. We'd love to be able to uh, come and visit. Absolutely. So have you ever gone into a lab to test the air? And has there ever been a lab that doesn't need any air purifying? <laughs> That's a good question. That, that is a very good question. And to answer your question, every lab we have visited, the testing results come back on the higher side. And it's, you know, when you're in sales, it's, it's, it's an easy conversation to have when you're talking about air quality, when you're actually in a dental lab, you know, I run North America sales for air treatment and, and we sell the all different verticals, but when you're in a lab and especially when you're, you're doing air quality checks or you're doing a demonstration and the machine is showing you visually how the air quality is, it just, it just makes the conversation on the sales side go that much smoother. So we have not found a lab where mm -hmm. the air quality has been perfect. I'd say what we have found labs where, you know, the, the decision maker, the person holding the budget doesn't believe in this and, and makes a decision to not want to invest. And at the end of the day, there's no hiding away from the fact that many things, this is an investment and you've got to want to take some action. And this is a, this is an issue that can be swept under the carpet and ignored, or this is an issue that can be, you know, faced head on and dealt with. Yeah. And to add to that too, it, in, in working with lab owners, you know, we're finding it's really a family environment where they have brothers and sisters and family members working, you know, within the environment, they want a health and wellness play, not only for their family, but for their employees. And, you know, to keep the, the best of the best CDTs to stay in their labs. So it's really going above and beyond. And Tad saw that right away on, on how we could help him have a, a, a healthier work environment for his employees. And, and to take it to the another, a next level, we at Fellows, we also launched last year, we have sit-stand desks where uh, Tad's currently testing in his lab for his technicians, you know, not to be sitting, you know, eight hours a day where they can sit and stand throughout the day, which is better for the employee. Sweet. Like it. Yeah, we actually have, we actually gave one to one of our CAD guys, and I know he really enjoys the sit-stand desk. It helps throughout the day. My employees all stand. Really? I mean, it's, it's cool. Oh, yeah, they love it. Some of the girls don't even have chairs anymore. They put them in the closet. Even the ones that are seen finishing or the ones in the CAD department are all over? I mean, all my, my, my lab, my lab managers, my staining glazers, really? um, the contour girls. Yeah, they all stand. Oh, my God. Interesting. They love it. This is a really um, interesting segue because I don't know if you've, I guess you've, you've seen the, the Business Insider article that, I think it was originally published in 2015 and then it was updated again in 2018 where it publishes this list of um, the most um, unhealthy occupations in, in the US. And you're going to say it's us? <laughs> <laughs> it, it probably, it publishes the most un, unhealthy occupations in the US and it looks at six core parameters. So exposure to contamination, exposure to disease and infection, uh, exposure to hazardous conditions, exposure to radiation, risk of burns, cuts, bites, and then time spent sitting. Time spent sitting is the sixth parameter that they look at. And um, originally in 2015, they grouped together a number of dental professions and, and that took the number one spot out of 27 jobs. And then in 2018, when they updated that list, they actually extended it to publish a list of 47 of the most damaging and un unhealthy occupations. Um, and in that updated list in 2018, out of the top seven, five of them are dental related occupations. Mm. And um, the number four spot is actually a dental laboratory technician. Wow. The reason that was ranked uh, number four is, uh, first of all, exposure to contamination. It scored 99 out of a possible 100. Um, time spent sitting was the second reason, scoring 85 out of 100. And then the third reason was exposure to disease and infection, hmm. which scored 72 out of 100. So out of all the parameters, it scored a total of 65.7, which put it at number four, uh, the number one spot scoring uh, 72.8. So it's um, it's scary. And this, this was ranked more unhealthy than professions such as flight attendants, uh, vets, mining related industries, critical care nurses. A big thank you to Tad, Blake, and Mike 
Join us next week as we continue to talk about air quality in dental labs. It gets even scarier when we start talking about protecting our employees from the influenza. Yeah, Mr. Influenza ourselves here, Elvis, Mr. One and Two. I bet you in your laboratory it sucked that right out of the air. It was pretty ironic. About a week after we recorded this about air quality, I end up with double strain of the flu. Exactly. So in this interview, Mike mentions a Business Insider article. I have a link to it up on this episode's webpage on VoicesFromTheBench.com. It's amazing when you click on the article, the amount and kind of careers you have to scroll through before you get to number four, which is, of course, the dental technician. It's just crazy how we're a riskier industry than some of the ones on this list. Exactly. So let's clean up our Hopefully you enjoyed listening to this and join us next week to hear about even more. So I got two new links up on VoicesFromTheBench.com. One is for the Voices From The Bench t-shirts, as always, where the profits go to the foundation. And the other is to buy a raffle ticket to win a Harley Davidson. Again, all the money goes to the foundation. Only 25 bucks to get you a chance to win. So check out both the links at VoicesFromTheBench.com. And please, because it goes to a great source... And I want to win the motorcycle. I've already got uh, like $200, so let's go, guys. Donate, please. Barbara says if she wins, she's going to buy me a little sidecar so I can ride with her. I will. We'll go live. We'll be like VoicesFromTheBench.com live from our motorcycle. Route 66. (laughs) I'll be drinking. Elvis won't. Wait a minute. But join us. Shouldn't I be driving then? Yeah, probably. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. As always, tell everybody in the industry about us. They can hear us wherever podcasts are found, Spotify, YouTube, or directly at VoicesFromTheBench.com. And anyone listening to us on an Apple podcast, take a second and give us a review. We would appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Anytime I can spend an evening at home with puppies and wine, I'm good.